Hey, and welcome to another Cryptic Spires deck tech. Today, I will be talking about Riel the Everwise. Riel the Everwise is a human wizard. Riel gets plus one plus L for each instant or sorcery card in your graveyard. And whenever you discard one or more cards the first time each turn, draw that many cards. We will be talking pros, cons, and how to maximize Riel's ability to draw massive amounts of cards. First up today, we have strengths and weaknesses of Riel. Riel draws cards. That's what she does. And she draws cards in massive quantities. It's one of the greatest things about playing her. If you like to draw, this is a really great commander to play. She also makes mediocre cards better or great. Careful study, faithless looting. These cards become discard two, draw four, essentially. That's awesome. She makes staple cards even better. Things like LED gamble all those things that make you discard are now boons because you get the mana you get the card you're searching for and you're going to draw on top of it always really nice to have an extra draw in case those things fail she's amazing for underworld breach you're constantly going to be filling your graveyard and on top of that you are able to do tricks and lines of play that other commanders can't because you can refill your hand and fuel your graveyard and if led is in graveyard that's more cards to add so she is really powerful for underworld breach riel is a potent threat in combat she can get upwards of 20 power easily in some grindier games which is a very real threat which forces people to block with creatures they don't want to block with and in case somebody is struggling for creatures you're always able to swing and get commander damage putting them on a time clock Lastly, Roselia is resilient. Because of that card draw, even if she's removed or you're behind in a game, you can always make plays that get you a bunch of cards, change the tune of the game, and present an opportunity or a window for you to win. The deck is very dependent on Rial. We need her out there to engine our game plan. Without Rial on the field, our card quality is much lower than a Grixis pile or something that is more tuned to CDH. We are kind of a strange duck in that meta, but it is what gives us our advantage as well because we get to play low mana spells that draw so much, but they aren't good if Rial isn't out there, which makes her a target. She will be a target when you go to discard. We will discard cards and be killed before we can get our trigger on Riel. It's just going to happen. It's the nature of the beast. It's going to stink because you're pitching cards and not refreshing your hand. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do but kind of be prepared for it and adapt and overcome. Riel forces difficult decisions. She is about discarding. We are sometimes going to have hands that are good, but not good enough to get us there. And our best game plan is, unless it's an underworld breach, to discard. And that means sometimes we're going to discard things that could have won us the game or could have saved us because in our search for our own victory, we have to be really smart and really cagey and you're not always going to make the right choice. It is a fact of life of playing the deck, but one of the things I enjoy about it is because we're seeing so many cards, we also have the opportunity to find the right thing. It's just those decisions aren't always going to be easy. Becoming attached to certain things is unwise in this reality ever wise deck. Orcish Bowmaster is a bugaboo for us. It is the bogeyman. We are always we should always be ready and be prepared for an orcish bowmaster to drop there are things to mitigate it but know that because you're drawing in such large chunks there's a very real possibility that real will be killed and you could be killed or have your life dangerously depleted by an orcish bowmaster while making a huge army for an opponent nature of the beast and i'd rather draw cards than not real is also very much a mid-range deck it is not designed to go fast we don't have access to demir so we don't have the fallback that a lot of grixis mid-range decks do where they 
Always have access to Demonic Consultation and Thossus Oracle. Without that early out or a way to turbo if we're in a very, very greedy pod or a very, very fast pod, sometimes we're just going to have to kind of pray and hope that somebody doesn't have a win or mulligan for hands that don't necessarily help us a ton, but help prevent losses. It's just something to be aware of. And finally, Real does wither to certain stacks pieces, like any deck, but even more so than others. Because, again, we don't have consultation, we don't have that backup plan against Deafening Silence, and our card quality is lower. So, if we're not able to draw cards because of Spirit of the Labyrinth, Narset Parter Veils, Notion Thief, whatever it may be, we are susceptible to being blown out by those things because if we can't remove them, we don't really have a way to keep going and digging and feeling our win. There are ways around it and we have plans for everything, but just be aware that certain stacks decks are gonna do pretty well against Real. Just like any other deck, magic is a game of rock, paper, scissors, and sometimes we're gonna be scissors and they're gonna be the rock. This Real deck primarily seeks to win using Breach Lines of Underworld Breach, Brain Freeze, and Lion's Eye Diamond. We can use Lotus Petal as a substitute, though it does take more fuel in the graveyard for that to work, which isn't always a problem. We also have the added benefit of playing Burning Inquiry, which on its own is not a great spell, but in a pinch can help us search for that Brain Freeze in order to get to our victory now how do we actually win the game because that line doesn't win it just presents an opportunity for us to win and gives us access to the most of the cards in our library we actually win the game either through a Thossus oracle and by having no cards in library or just a few cards in library and our devotion to blue being higher and grape shot which is more of a backup plan for if, for whatever reason, Thossus is exiled off the stack or unknown reasons break in case of emergency. It's just also a useful card to ping a troublesome, a few troublesome creatures if our storm count is high enough. Our backup win cons are using Brawlin and Discard to deal to put one one counters on her and deal one damage to everybody, and then go to Beatsville with Rial and our trampling Brawlin. With a Harmonic Prodigy and a Brawlin in play, she can get huge really, really quick, dealing lots of damage, and because she's enabled, she can get trampled, we can hit people for large swaths of damage um, and continue that cycle of just discarding on each turn and doing damage to each person and eventually sucking them down and killing them. And since a lot of decks use life as a resource, they're often going to be hurting themselves as well, so it makes it a little easier. But, again, this is a, a mid-range breach deck. We're looking to do that, it's our main line. We don't have a ton of combos outside of that. I find by being focused on this one thing, we are a better deck. The first of our cards to note is Foil. Foil is a four cost, two generic, two blue pips that says choose and discard an island in your hand and another card instead of paying Foil's mana cost counter target spell. It's a really useful thing to have another free counter spell available to us that in other decks would be maybe a little bit too pricey or a lot of CEDH decks can't play islands or don't have the capacity to because they're in Grixis colors and trying to Tainted Pact or they're in three color piles. It's just hard to fit more than maybe one or two islands in there unless you're really heavy blue. But for us, we have quite a few and we're in limited colors and there's no reason not to play basics. So we are, have the ability to have access to islands and by pitching cards, we get to draw cards. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Being able to f foil somebody's attempt at a win with a free counter spell they weren't expecting and draw two cards off of it is crazy value town. And kind of the space that this deck 
thrives is unexpected value. Wheel of Misfortune is a three cost sorcery. What's interesting about it is I played this card as a substitute because I don't have access to a wheel and I don't play in a primarily a proxy friendly environment. And what started as a card I played by necessity has become a card I play by my own prerogative. I find that what Wheel of Misfortune does, which it makes you just a quick synopsis because the text on the card is one of the most confusing in all of Magic. What Wheel of Misfortune does is it makes each player secretly choose a number. The lowest doesn't wheel, the highest pays life for that number in wheels, and the middle two wheel. We get the effect of the wheel where we get to discard, draw our seven, and then draw whatever we discard while everybody else just draws seven, so we get the extra value off a of real, um, which can draw you upwards of a ton of cards, a buttload of cards. It's finger licking good. In the scientific terms. What it does do as a side effect and what I didn't expect is that it conveys a lot of intel about what's happening at the table. It tells you who doesn't like their hand, who does like their hand. We're usually trying to pick in a middle number so that we don't pay the life we want to wheel, but it lets us know who is going balls out to get that wheel because they have nothing and who really wants to keep their hand because maybe they have a win attempt or they have a counter spell in hand or they have something they really value. And that intel is as important as the card draw often because it can tell us, hey, be watch, watch out for Gary because Gary's going to try to win on his next turn. And if other players are smart, they're picking up on that too. And that that information being shared around the table is good for us because we want the game to go longer. Next up, we have Attunement. Attunement is an enchantment that says, return Attunement to your hand, draw three cards, then choose and discard four cards. So for us, that basically means draw seven, discard four. It's repeatable. It has an ability to be activated at instant speed so we can do it in response to things. Oftentimes, I'll have already cast a Faithless Looting. Someone goes to flash into Orcish Bowmasters, and in response, we can do this before the Orcish hits the battlefield. And so it gives us a chance to counter Orcish or find an answer, find something. It's a really fun and interesting way to draw seven cards, and we can do it whenever we need to. And that's what makes it so good. So our, we have some controversial cuts. The first being Rhystic Study. People might be surprised that it's not in Riel. And in the past, I've said every blue deck should run a Rhystic Study. But we have so much card draw. And drawing at the prerogative of the opponent is not something we necessarily need. We're not looking for an engine the same way Grixis piles are. Our commander is the engine. We have plenty of card draw. We just, we can play another three mana spell like the ones previously talked about to draw us cards in big bunches. So it's not really needed here. The second card is Glinthorn Buccaneer. Now, that one might be more surprising since it operates in a similar way as Brawlin and allows us to discard and drain the table and we could potentially have a combo by sticking our third card, a Curiosity, onto Glinthorn Buccaneer and going to discard and drawing, discarding, drawing, discarding, draining the whole table one life at a time. And you're right, that's a good combo, especially in a discard-oriented deck. But I found that one, two red pips is sometimes difficult for us to get. Not usually, but it can be, and to getting, uh, having a single curiosity effect in a deck that doesn't tutor well was often hard to get to. And so it was just better to focus in on the breach lines and not have this, and not muddle, muddle the mixture, ha 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 ha, not muddle the, the, the plan of the deck 
by adding this kind of unnecessary element. I would rather have Brawlin if I'm going to have one because Brawlin is a shaman so she can be doubled by Harmonic Prodigy and two, she not only drains the table but she gets big for combat damage as we talked about earlier which makes her a slight upgrade plus she's three generic and one red pip which is just easier to cast most of the time. So those are our somewhat controversial cuts. Rial is an interesting commander to play because you have access to more cards, you see more cards than almost anybody else. You have to play it smart though because you need to get rid of cards to get cards. You have to operate almost like a Buddhist monk where forget these earthly possessions because something greater awaits you and that's always how it is with Riel. There's only one, there's only one card that you don't send to grave and that's Underworld Breach which we've hit on again and again and again. I can't stress that enough. That card needs to be protected like Gitrog protects Dockmore Salvage. Don't overcommit. It's very easy to ha be able to rush out a Real and then not be able to do anything. And because we're slower, we need to understand that sometimes playing a land and passing is just going to be fine if it involves a counter uh, a counter spell or a way to protect our not protect our win, but protect us ourselves from losing. Mulligan aggressively. When you're mulliganing, you should be looking for a way to get Riel, probably turn two, and a piece of draw. If you can have Riel turn one and a piece of draw turn two and counter spells, that's great. But remember, we're gonna lose some games in the first three turns just the way it is because we're slower. We're counting on the rest of the table and our own interaction and our read of that table to make sure that we can get to the point where we're gonna um, have the most success. Just because you can discard and draw doesn't mean you should. It's very easy to get excited about drawing and start thrill of possibility and pitching stuff and doing stuff, but if you don't have a way to kind of chain those together, you can run out of gas. Finally, my biggest trip is have fun and draw lots of cards. You're playing Real because you don't care about winning or losing, you care about drawing. And as long as you go with that mindset, I do my very best. As soon as I start to play turboing for a combo, I lose. Where this deck is strongest is when you have a pile, a pile in the grave and a pile in your hand and you are kind of the master of your own destiny. So remember kids, Grandma gets freaking big and worse comes to worse, start beating on people with an old lady with a stick. Play the grandma, man. She's awesome. I can't recommend her enough. I really enjoy making these, so thanks for being out there. Thanks for being you. Have fun playing Magic. And try new decks. And if you have something cool or tips or tricks for me, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear advice and criticism. Peace, love. See you next time, Kimosabi.